We now return to Illinois Rising, presented by the Illinois Policy Institute, the radio show discussing the honest truth about Illinois policy and politics. Here's AM 560's Dan Proft. Dan Prof back on this edition of Illinois Rising with my co-host Cole Lauterbach, reporter for the Illinois News Network, and former State Senator Steve Rauschenberger talking about the budget and what is to come next after no budget uh, was consummated by the General Assembly for the second year running. Um, so, Steve, you were not only a member of the Senate, you were a member of the Senate when Republicans were in the majority. You were a Senate Finance Committee chairman. You were involved in these, these uh, budgetary discussions in a material way. You're also for people who may have short memories about the General Assembly, I mean, you were really the budget expert. You were really the numbers guy in the Senate, particularly for Republicans. And so as you see what's happening, as you're still an advocate in your position today for small to mid-sized manufacturing companies, how was what you did when you had divided government with Madigan as the speaker and Pate Phillip as the Senate president, Republicans in control of the Senate. How was that process when you participated different than what you're seeing play out today? Well, in, in the 90s, you, you had a downstate governor, you had a suburban Senate president, you had a city of Chicago speaker, you had a Republican governor, a Republican Senate president, and a Democratic speaker. There was there was balance. You know, nobody could get away with much because people watched each other. Illinois is as regional in a lot of ways as it is partisan. Uh, what happened after Rod Blagojevich won the election and the Democrats ran the table and every constitutional officer of the state of Illinois was from the city of Chicago and only one of them was a Republican. I mean, we, we lost that balance. We lost a partisan balance. We lost the regional balance. And and the Democrats, who had a pretty thin bench because they hadn't controlled the executive branch in a long time, brought in all the bright minds that, who've run the city of Chicago and the, the city parks and the, and the Cook County government into the off the road and, and installed them running the mechanics. Of, of government. Uh, in the first two years, while the Democrats were in charge, they at least shared budget data with us and allowed us to prepare, you know, questions for their department heads. But by year three of my service under Blagojevich, they would no longer answer the questions of the Republican uh, Appropriation Committee. We, we, our finance committee couldn't get data from the departments. So they refused to answer our, our ISOs. And so, you know, they essentially shut down the information could, so you couldn't have a debate. Um, and that's when we passed that really thoughtful pension bond deal where we created $10 billion of pension bonds and capitalized 30 years of, 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 of um, arbitrage gains and pretended we had them in one year and let Rod Blagojevich spend it into his budget. Uh, Rod, in his State of the State address, hailed himself as a financial genius. Um, well, you know, I don't know how that's working out for him in, in prison, but it's not working out very well for the state of Illinois. That was a massive debacle. And a Shakespearean scholar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you built a $2.2 billion cliff by creating a, a, a phantom revenue that you didn't have money for in year two. So that's when the trouble begins. Um, but in those days, at least, um, there was open debate. The, the, the Senate sat down with the House. Republicans and Democrats were represented at the table. Downstate interests, suburban interests, and city interests were compromised. And that's why we had balanced budgets. And, and also, we had a pretty good economy in the 90s, I'm one of the first to admit. And we paid down debt and we reduced taxes. You, um, you talk about there was a, there was there were checks and there were balances between the two houses. Uh, could you explain a little bit? I mean, I know you're in the Senate, but it, the, the House Rules Committee is kind of the basis of where Speaker Madigan gets all of his say on um, what happens and what doesn't happen as, as in compared to the Senate, where it's more of a democratic situation where you know bills can come up and find their way having a discussion about them. And the, the House, not so much. Yeah, well, and, and it's, it's interesting to note how different Illinois is than most states. In most states, if you have five to seven sponsors on a bill, the bill gets a hearing in committee automatically. The, the Speaker of the House can't say that bill can't be heard. And that the chairman of the committee can't hold that bill without a hearing. In other words, there's there's rights for members in most of the other 49 states to bring legislation out, have a public debate, have testimony on it, and let people understand an issue. In, in, in Mike Madigan's house, every bill goes to the Rules Committee. He decides on a case-by-case basis after his staff analyzes it what can go to a committee and what committee it goes to. And then if it survives the committee process, it goes to the, to the House calendar, which he allows thousands of bills onto. And then instead of calling his calendar in numerical order so a member can predict when their bill is going to be heard, he does a special order every morning and decides what bills will be heard. So not only do you have to beg the Speaker to get your bill out of the Rules Committee, you have to beg the Speaker to put it in an appropriate committee where you have a chance to pass it. If you get it out of committee, you have to beg to have him put it on a special order to have the bill heard. 
I mean, this is it's it just so undemocratic and, and so so oppressive and authoritarian. It, it, it's as if Bill Belichick running, you know, the new. <laughs> it, 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 it's as if he controlled the the referees, the shape of the field. He decided each play whether his team would be on offense or defense. I mean, you know, it, it, it's just bizarre. There, there, it's not a system that's used anywhere else by any other body, and it, it's because the sheep in the Illinois House, and particularly the Democrats, let the speaker have whatever rules he wants. And and that's really important because we focus on Madigan and all the money he amasses and that's how he maintains control over his caucus and frankly intimidates a lot of Republicans as well is because of the money that he has that he distributes for uh, elections and re-elections but it's also this process of I can't do anything as a state legislator as long as I'm in the minority or if I want to stay in good favor in the majority if I fall out of favor with one person. Yeah, ask Jack Franks how many bills he's tried to introduce that got hung up in the House Rules Committee. Jack Franks is a Democrat from McHenry who purports to be kind of an independent, and in some ways he is. Um, but, I mean, his bills don't get out of the Rules Committee. And, and the idea of allowing thousands of bills onto the calendar is simply so that members can't read and understand the bills. I mean, in, in good but, years... But to be fair, some of the members actually cannot read. <laughs> Well, that's true in some cases. There, they certainly don't um, practice it a lot. But back in the day, when the process worked pretty well, the Senate would have five to six hundred bills on a final action calendar. You'd go through them over the course of two weeks, so every bill used to be called two to three times. So when that bill was called as a sponsor, you rose and you could bring it for final action. But when you put thousands on the calendar and you let chaos reign in your chamber. Only probably 15% or less of the bills that make the House third reading calendar ever get heard on the floor. Well, and this is also how he does what he did with his $7 billion out-of-balance budget that he rammed out of the House and sent over to the Senate, uh, where he gives the General Assembly, members of the House, I should say, 500-page budget uh, two hours before they're going to vote on it. Right. You, you pass it to find out what's in it. Yeah, with no analysis, with no help, with no hearings. I mean, back in the 90s when the process worked pretty well, the House and the Senate both hold held extensive hearings with the agencies so that members understood the programs because it's the programs of state government to spend the money. I mean, you know, it's not Xerox paper that's that's breaking the bank. It, it, it's the Medicaid program. It's the, the shape and scope of how corrections works. It's the determinations made in the Department of Human Services that decide how much money is going to get spent. So, But today's legislator has gone more than seven years without substantive appropriation hearings. They have no idea how their own programs work. They, their idea of, they don't have an idea of reform. That's why there's so much talk about cuts of 5% across the board or 3% because they don't have substantive input or understanding about how to fix the program. But was that, I mean, was it different when you were, uh, for the most of your time in the state Senate, because you had Republican control of the state Senate, so Madigan had to play ball? Yeah, well, yeah, and he did. And, and a Republican governor. Exactly, because, so when we go into the budget negotiations, we're debating how the Department of Children and Family Services worked, not just the gross amount that went into it. You know, we debated whether whether you ought to index for inflation the, the, the foster care grants that you gave families for taking children. I mean, should we be paying people to be a parent? I mean, we were paying adoption subsidies that lasted until a child was 21. And there was a fundamental disagreement between the House and the Senate, Republicans and Democrats, whether once you decide to an adopt a ward of the state, you know, are, are we still paying you, you know, big money to keep the kid? I mean, so those are the kind of debates we had that, that that's the only reason my parents kept me after they adopted. So <laughs> it's an important program for me. <laughs> but I mean, today's legislator is crippled because they, they don't have hearings. They, they don't have the kind of in-depth discussion. Uh, and so, you know, Madigan controls all the cards. Uh, you you mentioned too the fact that there's there's hundreds of votes that are on the, the, the daily calendar, so they don't have time to read it. Now, some of these some of these bills that are on uh, the calendar. They start off as a one dollar bill, uh, not a like it's it's they they appropriate one dollar. It's a shell bill. There's nothing to it. There's nothing substantive. All of a sudden, there comes an amendment that's a five hundred page amendment that appropriates seven billion dollars out of out of whack budget. Right. Yes. And that's yeah. that's another thing that even if you do see something, right. you on the calendar, it may not be that by the time it gets to House. Yeah, and then, you know, we've lost that because it used to be members of the General Assembly that, that debated the budget and then drew up the, the final agreement. Now, in the end, we would go for the last three, four hundred thousand, three hundred, three or four hundred million 300, 400 million of disagreements to the governor and to the legislative leaders. But Pate Phillip did not negotiate the budget. I did with a staff of 12 Republican staffers, and I shared it with a, an appropriate committee of 15 members. 
So, you know, there, there, were, there was member involvement all the way along. The, the, so when I stood to present a budget, people knew most of what was in it. I mean, you know, they, they, it's hard to be an expert on how complex state government is, but, but today there's none of that. It, 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 that's why the, the, the debate is so vacuous. It's he said, she said. And, and most of the time, they're not even accurate in what they're saying. Where do we go from here if we don't want to go to another state? <laughs> well, you know, it, it's, it's not fun. I mean, you know, it, it, just like you never want your kid to have a car accident. You never want your, 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 your daughter to have a, a bad romantic experience. You, you don't, you know, you don't want your, your, your friend to fall downstairs, but stuff happens and it's already happened in the state of Illinois. The question is whether we're going to recognize we've already had a disaster and start fixing it. Um, and that means legislators sitting in Springfield until they pay attention, until they get sick of letting Mike Madigan and John Cullerton call the tune. And, you know, I, I hope we get there. He is former state senator Steve Rauschenberger, now the president of the TMA, the Technology and Manufacturing Association advocate for small to mid-sized manufacturers in this state. Steve, thanks as always for joining us. Great. Had a good time. Thank you.